we could all uh, come together. So today is a very another very special day for the Department of Surgery and a time that we uh, celebrate and honor the trauma tradition that we have here. And to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to our Chief of Trauma, Joe Galante. Thank you. So this is the uh, Felix Battistella lecture. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying a few words about Dr. Battistella. Um, I realized, thinking about this, that we're at the point where there aren't any residents that were in training, that are currently in training, that um, knew Dr. Battistella. Even Ben Keller wasn't here. Um, <laughs> and he's been here a while. Um, so for most of the people here that that knew Felix were our faculty, both junior and senior faculty. And um, I think many of us would say he was both a mentor and a friend. I, I can certainly speak for myself. Um, he was a, truly a mentor. He was a, the program director when I started residency and then progressed to be the chief of trauma um, during my residency. And as you can tell, it's a similar path to one that I, that I have followed. He was an intimidating man, to say the least. Um, rounds as an intern were also, were usually just a series of fear, um, and you just had words coming out of your mouth, not really sure what they were. He tried to put you back in, in place, but um, that just added more to the fear. Um, like many of us, he had a lot of teaching vignettes that he always would, would go through. Um, I won't go through those right now, but I will tell you the one that really stands out the most in my mind was his idea of you basically need to just do the right thing for the patient. It was That was the running theme that you would hear in your mind um, from him over and over. Typically, you'd hear it in your mind over and over when you had 55 notes to write, but there was a patient that wasn't doing well on the floor. Do you get up and go see that patient or do you finish your notes? You do the right thing and you go see the patient. The idea at 3 o'clock in the morning when you're getting called for another cellulitis and you know that that's not how the grid is set up, that you as the surgery resident should not be going down to take care of the cellulitis, you get up and you hear in your mind, just do the right thing, go down, take care of the patient, admit them, and make sure that things are taken care of. And that's really the lasting legacy that, that Felix kind of instilled into those of us that he trained and those of us that uh, he practiced with. I think it's rather appropriate that just do the right thing for the patient is kind of uh, Felix's motto, and we'll couple that today with what you'll hear from Dr. Scalia in terms of his uh, Grand Rounds uh, lecture here. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jerkovich, who many of you know, um, who actually was last year's uh, Felix Battistella lecturer. Um, is now on faculty, so we're going to try to do the same with Dr. Scalia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. Uh, I won't say too much for the introduction for Tom because uh, I want to save most of the time for his presentation. Um, let, let me begin by this: we're fortunate to have uh, literally an, a, a, a living legend in American trauma surgery give the Felix Battistella lecture today. Uh, and I say this as Tom is both my friend um, and a colleague that I've worked with and someone I've admired for many, many, many years. His, his background, fascinatingly, began at uh, Kings County Hospital in New York, where, among other things, of leading one of the busiest, busiest trauma surgeons in the United States during the, what's often called the cocaine wars of New York City and managing more penetrating trauma the, in the one week than most of us would end up seeing in a lifetime these days. He also started a department of emergency medicine. Go figure. That, that, that has served him so very well throughout his a, a career because he's a, a, adopted many friends, colleagues in the emergency medicine field that have translated into much shared research and much shared investigations. His CV is voluminous. Uh, and he's most readily known now for being the uh, chief of surgery at uh, the Maryland Shock Trauma Institute, or MIMS, started by R. Adams Cowley, and one of the unique trauma institutions in the country, in that while affiliated with the university, it's a separate tower, a brand new tower that he ended up getting constructed in the last uh, year, um, a separate building, a separate faculty, a great deal of independence, and serves as a single designated trauma center for the state of Maryland, 
and to manage all aeromedical transport through it through the state operated, highway patrol operated, single aeromedical transport vehicle. It gives them both an advantage of a huge amount of blunt trauma from a wide region as well as all the penetrating that trauma that occurs in the Baltimore region and as a result, I think it's uh, probably the busiest uh, uh, trauma center in the United States, particularly when you combine both blunt and penetrating uh, issues together. So I'll last conclude uh, by this issue of a current legend there. I don't think there has been, in fact, I'm pretty positive about this, a single person who has been president of both the major trauma societies in one year. This year, Tom is president of the Western Trauma Association and also president of the American Association for Surgery Trauma, the AAST. Uh, he accepted those uh, with, with some reservations, I know, because he thought, how can I do a good job of addressing both of them during the same year uh, when both demand so much of my attention? But he's handled that with great aplomb uh, and with great leadership. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Tom Scalia. Thank you. Good morning. Let me reset this. To say it's a pleasure to be here would be a little bit of an understatement. As a matter of fact, it would be a huge understatement. And to give the Battistella Lecture is an honor that uh, I thought about, I don't know, maybe three milliseconds when Joe said, would you give the Felix Hughes Lecture? Yes, I, I, I am happy to do that. Now, Felix was a good friend, his colleague. We met, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago or so. I was relatively new at Maryland. And we did some double AST thing together, and we got to know one another. Began a relationship that involved uh, both cold and warm beverages at uh, the appropriate times and dinner and uh, w w what most of you don't know is that uh, we were talking, and I said, you're going to stay at Davis? He said, yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to stay at Davis. I said, well, what would it take to get you to move? And he said, uh, the perfect job. I said, what does that mean? So we talked for a little bit, and I went home, and I think there was email way back then. I think I sent him an email. But it could have been a letter that was, you know, you, you put a stamp on that. And, and I said, here is your perfect job with a plane ticket to come to Maryland. And we had a number of conversations, several visits. And I said, why don't you just come help me run the place. And when I keel over, you can have it. Uh, we got pretty close. And he decided he was going to stay in Sacramento, it uh, kind of broke my heart, you know, the two Italians, the two AAST Italians, the East Coast and the West Coast Italians. Next time I saw Felix was in Baltimore, and um, I'm, I just, I had done a case, I went and talked to the family, I'm walking by, and this lady comes up and says, Dr. Scalia, I said, yeah, I said, I'm Christine Battistella, and I, Okay, I mean, I remember you, but you're sitting in my hospital. She said, Felix is here. Felix was getting biopsy to see if he was a candidate for experimental therapy for his cancer. It's never anything you want, right? You don't want to need experimental therapy for your cancer. And uh, he, she said, she's in the recovery room. And I, so I walked in, and I, you know, what do you what are you supposed to say, right? So I did the only thing I could think of. I said, you came to my city and you didn't call me. You came to my hospital and you didn't call me. And the worst is, you stayed in a hotel. And you stayed in a bad hotel. I mean, what is, what is going on? And he looked at me and he st I hugged him and we just started laughing. It's the last time I saw Felix. And, and I give up. The mouse? The mouse will work? I give up. I broke it. Didn't take me long. And you ask, why do you have these lectures, right? Well, 
it's for those of us that knew Felix, but you guys don't. And try again. Other way. Um, it's kind of a cool group of people when you come right down to it. It's, you know, a bunch of the trauma guys. Steve Bartlett. Steve's the chair of surgery at Maryland, so it's a, it's a little, it's kind of a small club for me. And, you know, 50 years from now when I'm long gone, somebody will have named a bathroom for me at the Shock Trauma Center or something. They say, Who, who's that guy? I don't know, he's some guy who used to work here. That, that's how this goes, right? I don't know who it was. But it means we get special breakfast at Grand Round. So. And it, it occurs to me that you do these to commemorate people, but you do it because they're really not dead. And Felix continues to teach us. He teaches us through these people hopefully through me this morning, and um, hopefully I will do him proud. Now the story goes back, this, the story we're going to tell today goes back 20 years. It's 1997, I'm sitting in Snowbird, and that guy walks out onto the stage and gives the Western Trauma Association presidential lecture. I think the symptoms first began when I bent over to adjust a backyard sprinkler head, I was distinctly uncomfortable, unable to get enough air. I found myself sitting on the wet ground, dizzy and confused, similar to many days that Jerry is dizzy and confused. <laughs> wow, I really need to lose some weight. And it was, all of us that have been in this business probably remember three lectures, though we've been to a thousand. That's one of mine. It was perfect. Jerry was the patient. He talked about his battle with lymphoma. He mostly talked about his battle with the healthcare system. He was a clinician. He taught me more about lymphoma than I wanted to know, I think, that day, Jerry. And he was the president. After everybody left, I just sat in the room because I didn't want the feeling to go away. And paint the ceiling is about being the patient. The patient lies on the bed, sees the ceiling, sees the CT gantry sees stuff that we don't see. And in his case, it was the peeling paint on the ceiling. Hence the title, Paint the Ceiling. And now that I think about it, it was act actually the first lecture I heard on patient satisfaction. Nobody knew what that was back then, but that's what that was. Now, there are a whole bunch of people in the audience that have had the opportunity to be president of a society. I was just president of the AAST, and this was my presidential uh, address. And anybody that's done it knows that it's a completely exhausting, emotionally exhausting experience. You walk off the stage, and this weight is lifted. And I went home, and I was kind of depressed. That I was lethargic. I said I was tired, but Sharon Henry and Deb Stein and, and Stevie, the person that only needs one name that runs my life, um, they just said I was in a bad mood, and which, which is probably true. And I, I couldn't concentrate, so I did what I, we all do. I just went to work and buried myself. And one night, I was sitting in the office. We were in between cases, and I picked up, yes, a paper copy of a journal. So we used to get, you know, it got mailed to you, and you took the wrapper off, and you flip the pages, and I reread Jerry's president's address, and it sort of began to crystallize for me. Just uh, the week or two before, I had gone to what Dr. Bartlett calls an all-hands meeting to talk about co problems with colon cases. And there's me. Turns out I didn't know. I did 68 colons in two years. Um, made me the second busiest colon surgeon in the department, and my numbers really weren't all that good. Now, the quality of the data was complete crap. The one, I had a, this patient came in with a close-range shotgun wound to his abdomen with a colon injury. We debrided his abdominal wall. We did all the GI stuff. We put his colon together. I took him back two days later. I re-debrided the rest of his abdominal wall, and one of the nurses doing me a favor sent someone for, for culture Surprise, it grew gram-negatives. 
And they said, well, that's a deep space organ infection. I said, that's not a deep space organ infection. That's his disease. And they said, thanks for your opinion. Check, that's a deep space organ infection. Bye. But Steve said, you know, uh, listen, surgeons get better when they get data. That's probably true. The suits in the hospital said the results are publicly reported. Everybody can read your results. It is, after all, a matter of patient safety and satisfaction. I said, what does that mean, patient safety and satisfaction? Do you know, can you tell me what it means? Can you define it for me? Now, the next day, I, um, this lady got transferred in. She, as you can see, has terrible Ogilvy's. She had septic arthritis. I know this never happens here. She was transferred to orthopedics, which lasted about four seconds. <laughs> and we observed her. She had free air and peritonitis. I took her to the operating room and did an extended right hemicolectomy. Now, I hate ileostomies. I just hate them. They're terrible operations. Everybody does badly, particularly old people with them. And then you got to close them. And so I'm saying, do I do? You know, she's in septic shock. Do I put her together? What am I going to do? And I thought about my report card. And it didn't really ask to me. And I walked out of the operating room, and I was never so disappointed in myself as I was that day. Now, she's done fine. Still on TPN. We're still having trouble getting an early ostomy output under control. And did I do the right thing and the wrong thing? I, I, I don't know. But I know I thought about my report card. Now, this whole idea of patient safety goes back 15 or so years ago. This is the Institute of Medicine when they reported that there were 100,000 preventable, potentially preventable deaths in the United States each year from in-hospital errors. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Institute of Medicine. I will tell you one thing. Those people are really smart, and they're really pretty thoughtful, actually, and this is what they said, and you know you can read it, it makes some sense. And then Don Berwick, five years later, later reported on how are we doing five years after the IOM report. Don, who ran CMS for a while, chairs the first and I'm sure last IOM committee on which I will ever serve, because I'm me. And um, he's really... Uh, a good guy. He's really, really smart. Okay, all that makes sense. Now, can you actually measure this? M maybe. This is data from Hopkins. It said, we can look at safety and look at how variable it is over a 60 hospital system. Doesn't change by job description, but it changes by institution. Here's more data from Hopkins that says, the team huddle in the operating rooms in, improves the perception of patient safety. Perhaps not surprising, the surgeons thought everything was fine. The nurses and the anesthesiologists weren't quite so sure. This is work from Peter Pronovost, who's made a career out of this stuff in the ICU. This is the data on a daily checklist. It improved the residents' and nurses' perception that things were better. And now there's everybody loses their mind around this issue of in-hospital, particularly in-ICU-acquired infection. And it's a great thing. And we left catheters in too long. I get all of that. But in an attempt to make it better, what have we done? Well, we've measured what we can measure. Whether that makes any difference or not is maybe yes and maybe no. Now, I'm not going to stand up here. Anybody that stands up and says, I'm for more ICU-acquired infections is nuts. But how we go about trying to have the conversation, I think, is extremely Important. Now, we use national benchmarks. The results are displayed at every meeting, and public meetings are not only common, they're encouraged. So if you run a unit that's below the list, 
they say, why are you so bad? They tie the nurse manager's bonuses to this. If your unit is below par, whatever they say par is, you don't get a bonus that year. And we have infection control nurses that visit the ICUs and terrorize the bedside nurses. Why does that patient have a central line? Why does that patient have a Foley catheter? Just before I left, I got, e I got an email from the infection control nurse. This would be somebody with no additional training that is a self-designated expert on infection. And it said, you, your two patients last month had catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Indication for Foley. Urinary retention. That seems like an indication for a Foley catheter. To me, please review these charts to be sure that that Foley catheter was actually necessary. It was for urinary retention. I think they probably got UTIs because we didn't put the Foley in early enough when we let them sit with a liter in their bladder for two days because, by God, we didn't want to have a catheter-associated UTI. So now how does this work? The nurse managers encourage the staff, starts on ICU rounds, so if they can't, you know, bludgeon the attending to take it out, they start on the fellows after rounds. If that doesn't work, they go to the residents. And if that doesn't work, the poor schmo on call at night, <laughs> you, know how, you know the name of that tune, right? And how often do we say no to the nurses? And, and what we never ask is, how many people did we harm by not having the catheters in? Well, we can't measure that. But by God, we can measure the infections. In the last year, I have done three wide excisions of MRSA positive septic thrombophobitis in the upper extremity, a disease we never saw. Why? Because we are now giving caustic drugs through peripheral IVs. We used to deliver through central lines. Sharon walked into the ICU to find a lady she had done a chest wall excision and a modified radical mastectomy for an inflammatory can infected cancer that had three IVs in the ipsilateral arm. Now, usually you, you can't take a blood pressure in that arm, right? But she had three IVs because the ICU said, we, we don't want to put a central line and we don't want a clapsy. Is that better? I had a lady that had, had had a shotgun wound she was 18, I probably have done 20 laps on her. And, uh, you know, the endoscopy guys are great, right, until the time they perforated her duodenum and I got the opportunity to go do number 21. And I finally get her closed, and they extubate her. I walk in to see her an hour later as she gets re-intubated. I said, boy, I wonder if I closed her too tight. And maybe she's got compartment syndrome. So I pull, I, I ask the nurse, could you measure her bladder pressure? Foley's out. And I said, Foley's out? At that point, she had a heart rate of 144. She was making 3.5 liters of urine a day. I was so irritated, I put the Foley in myself just so that I could, you know, <laughs> blow some steam off. She's got a couple of urine-soaked pads in between her legs. And I looked at her and I said, why? And she looked, Dr. Scalia, that's our protocol to remove Foley catheters in extubated patients. I tried very hard to bite my tongue, but missed. <laughs> Dr. Stein had to come counsel me on my language choice. It's not our protocol, but we have beaten the nurses. So the first thing they do is take stuff out, whether it's a good idea or not. Now, the first real patient safety initiative, we didn't call it this, was the 80-hour work week. Who knows who that is? That's Libby Zion. Bonus question, Giancle Rosenbaum. They both died in New York City right around 1991 from what was thought to be a combination of inadequate resident supervision. Certainly, Mr. Rosenbaum did. 
since I'm still involved in the $65 million lawsuit around his death. I'm very clear on that. Um, what was the problem? Well, when the Libby Zion case went to trial, first malpractice case on court TV, the resident got up after making bonehead move after bonehead move and said, I was tired. He had been in the hospital 18 hours. He hadn't even worked 24 at that point, which we still say is OK. Well, what did we do? We couldn't really measure resident supervision very well. But by God, we could measure ours. So we said, OK, it's a problem of resident work hours. I don't care if you think it's a good idea or a bad idea. It doesn't really matter to me. What we said is it's 80. How do we pick 80? Oh, it was between 60 and 100, I, I guess. And because the ACG me said so. It's like, you know, you're dead. You, I'm doing it because I said so. You do it because I said so. And, and I w wasn't in the room, but talked to several people who said, you know, if we don't do this to government, somebody with initials is going to come do this, so we have to do it. So it's 80 hours. And we never actually asked, is it any better, until, I don't know, what is it, three weeks ago in the New England Journal, right? There's the protocol, oh, one ain't better. We now ask several other questions. Well, I mean, what the 80-hour work week has certainly done is it's blown up the idea of a team, right? Because you don't actually have a doctor anymore when you get admitted. You get admitted to a team. I'm told that the responsibility is shared, which is French for nobody's responsible, maybe except me. You get admitted to an attending who maybe talks to the family. Somebody takes over in the morning. Residents rotate by day. I, what I now do is I show up in the morning and I say, who's here? Because I have no idea who's here today or as opposed to who was here yesterday. You're seen by the call team and the faculty rotate and it would be reasonable to ask, who's my doctor? Well, I don't know. We now say, well, maybe the faculty should have limited hours. And this is despite the data that says, this is from Memphis, are you, what are the complication rates if you get operated electively by an attending that was on call the night before. No difference. Same is true with the gynecologists. No difference. Yet, in the commentary after these articles, the leaders of American surgery say the public has a right to have a well-rested surgeon. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. This is one of my favorites. This was January. Uh, this is a, an inc incredibly well-respected uh, institution that looked at the value of a checklist. So they handed the residents a checklist and said, every time you go talk to a family, you have to check those 11 boxes. And then surveyed the families and said, how did we do? And we did better, they did better, in essentially every category. Look at number seven. The physician told me that my family member would require urgent surgery. We need a checklist to remember to tell the family that their loved one needs an emergency operation. Are you kidding me? I mean, that's nuts. Now, you ask, we'll go back to paint the ceiling, what do the patients want. And I think what they want is for us to care about them, not just for them. And in our, uh, in our quest to try to um, measure this, we assume a relationship between some score and, and outcomes, right? And if all we do is do something because we can do it and it doesn't make any difference, it really 
doesn't matter. And there's precious little data to say this is better than that. And it's totally easy to game the system. You can design the survey so that the patients say, we love you. There was a, an intensive care unit in New York City that was the nation's leader in central line associated bloodstream infections. They didn't have one. Right up until the time somebody poked at that, and what happened is the ICU medical director forbade the residents from drawing blood cultures on any patient that had a central line. They just put them on antibiotics. Is that better? At Maryland, we now have a vice president of patient experience. Can somebody please tell me what that is? And when the CEO of Prescani, the leading scorer, was sir, asked about this, his response was, the train has left the station. Physicians that don't want to be scored just have something to hide. It's good to know we're using the highest quality information to gauge performance. Now, this is a fabulous study. It's 52,000 patients, I think, from Massachusetts, and they examined outcomes in patient satisfaction scores. If you were satisfied to use the ED less, but every other measure was worse, including mortality. The more satisfied you were, the more chances you had to die. Then you couldn't be dissatisfied anymore. <laughs> now, if you ask the patients, this is, I don't know, 27,000, uh, 10,000 patients, and you said, would you recommend this hospital? This is how they scored it. Not one of those has anything to do with the quality of care. This is a Wall Street Journal online survey. Would you leave your doctor? Would you change doctors? What would make you do that? You have to get way down to the bottom to get up to date or will admit you to a you know, highly regarded hospital. What the patients want is to believe that you actually care about them. Oh, like Felix would say, just do the right thing. Now, these are our press gainy scores. It's, I took a look at them last night after, I don't know, five or six glasses of wine at Dr. Kokonara's house. It gave me a different perspective. <laughs> the LRU, the Lung Rescue Unit, is a unit that is dedicated to ECMO. And we got beat up because we didn't give discharge information to the patients. And how many people do you discharge on ECMO? They said, Yo, you need to improve your scores. OK. Now, most people, you know, uh, you guys have chancellor problems. We got a different problem in Baltimore last year. The riots were unbelievable. And oh, the violence went through the roof, through the roof. Now, there were a bunch of issues in the hospital around this. I got that part. What did the University of Maryland do? Well. Twice in the last couple of months, I've had somebody's chest open at 9 o'clock at night. And this is what I... Good evening. It is now 9 p.m. Rest is an important part of healing. Please reduce the noise and turn down the lights in your area. We wish all of our patients a restful night. The vice president of patient experience. Guess what? Our press gainy scores aren't any better. That's what we did. The electronic medical record is the worst thing 
that has ever happened to taking care of patients. Anybody that's been a patient recently knows that their doctor looks at the screen, doesn't look at them. It's a huge amount of frustration. Somebody explain to me how it's possible to put an order into the computer and then have it disappear. Where's it go? They never work. We now, we know when we're on rounds, everybody's got a computer except me because I don't know how to use it. And it's like a race. If I say, I'd like to look at the CT scan, we see who can actually get on the damn system so that it'll display the images. And I, you know, I hate computers more than I hate ileostomies, but I just, I just envision this huge computer graveyard where all those lost orders are walking around trying to find their way back to the hospital. I mean, it's, it's, it's just crazy. This is my fellow, Christina Feather, my senior resident, Jamie Diaz, and Steph McGowan, my senior nurse practitioner, ordering a CTA. Took him eight minutes by my watch. Order got lost. Another seven minutes by my watch to get it done. 45 minutes of practitioner time to order a CTA. That's nuts. <laughs> I love me some epic. Now, this starts for me about 1984, as I reviewed it, as I started medical school. And in the fall of 1984, I went out to a uh, social event. And a friend of mine came up and said, let me introduce you to somebody, meet Patch Adams. I've known Patch for 40 years. He has had a profound effect on my life. This is us as I fixed Patch's uh, hernia. Turned 65, he actually had health insurance for the first time in his life. I'll let you decide if that's real or not. And if you think you know him because you saw the movie, if this will work. Health and health care are a human right for all people. I entered medical school in 1967 to use it as a vehicle for social change. I was a whole systems thinker. What I wanted to do was to create a hospital that addressed every single problem of healthcare delivery in one model. When I graduated in 71, no one gave us a hospital. So 20 adults, three of us physicians, and our children moved into a large six bedroom house and said we were a hospital. We are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all manner of medical problems from birth to death. In the 12 year pilot, we had 500 to 1,000 people in our home each month with five to 50 overnight guests a night. Never in our 40 year history have we charged money for anything. In fact, we wanted to eliminate the idea of debt in the medical interaction. We never wanted people to think they owed something. We wanted them to be excited that they belong to something called community. Our ideal patient was somebody who wanted to create a deep personal friendship with us. We have never had anything to do with third party reimbursement. I've never seen an insurance form. We never heard anyone say anything nice about an insurance company. We've never carried malpractice insurance because we know we are imperfect. We can always promise care. We can never promise cure. We need the right to make a mistake. In a way, we use their disease as a gimmick to get them into a university of human culture. We were teaching love, joy, humor, passion, hope, wonder, curiosity, creativity, intimacy, shared efforts with people. So we worked outside jobs to pay to practice medicine. For 40 years, I have paid to be a doctor. And I say that without any sense of sacrifice or long and hard journey. Rather, the unencumbered practice of care is an ecstatic experience worth paying to do. And this was, in a way, what the Hollywood movie picked up on. And that is that we were the first silly hospital in history. We were silly to live with and silly to die with. If you only have a week to live, I'm your man. <laughs> He's nuts. 
I mean, he's nuts. I, he is nuts. But what a great statement about putting the patient at the center of the healthcare enterprise. Now, I, I try to do this. I have one rule. The residents hate it. Every time we talk to a patient, I drag in chairs. Everybody sits on a chair and talks to the patient on their level. My eyes beat their eyes. Sitting down makes them think that you have all the time in the world. It's a lie. But that's what they think. And if you stand up, they think you're going to hit the door at a moment's notice. 90 seconds done correctly is all they actually want. But you have to do it the right way. Now, talking to the families in the ICU is another huge thing. And we have substituted information for communication. We think the more we tell them, the better informed they are. And that's a, a bit of a problem because what, if you're a patient's family and you're in the, your loved one's in the ICU, you do two things. You watch the monitors because it's better than TV. And you ask about stuff. And so the nurse, you know, here's the CBC today and this is the repeat BUN and creatinine. We can't agree what the numbers mean. How the hell do we expect the patient's families to get this? And I have innumerable examples. Most recently, I did a guy with total compartment syndrome, and I took him back, and he, everything was good. And I brought him back, and I said, everything was fine. This is good. And, and the mom said, but his myoglobin is up. That means he has dead muscle, the nurses told me. Where's the dead muscle? He's got renal failure. Come on. You know, we put up signs that says, this is DVT Awareness Month. And so then some mom comes and says, what are you doing to, says it's preventable. It says right here on that poster. Well, let's see, your son's got many broken bones. We can't put squeezers on. He's got a brain injury. We can't give him any chemo prophylaxis. What we're doing is nothing to prevent the lethal disease we just put up on the poster. They look at me like I have three heads. It's not very good. What I remember about being sick. One of our nurses. I was in a lot of pain, uh, a lot of discomfort at times. being scared. One of the things that really made me feel better was when I would be able to see progress. What I remember was important to me was the night that I got just moved from critical care to the step down unit and you walked in at 4.30 in the morning and said and pulled the curtain back which kind of startled me in and said Harold and I said yes Dr. Scalia. I think you're going to live. And I said, thank you. Was there any doubt? And you said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the inexperienced residents would just make the god awful faces when they looked at you. I could read you. Just look at your face. I could tell how I was doing. I was getting better or I wasn't getting better. God, he's sick as shit. You can tell by looking at him. Yes, I was worried about living. Um, one day, Ellen Plummer came up to visit me, and I felt like I had the feeling that while I was in Trendelenburg and I was just sliding away. And she grabbed a hold of my hand just to touch. And it just felt like something went through my body, and it felt like she was pulling me back. It felt like I was just sliding away right out the tunnel, right to the light, wherever you want to call it. I was just going away, and she felt like she just pulled me back. Yeah, we didn't do so well with that one. This one a little better. I think sometimes you don't understand the impact that you have on people. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. But uh, I, I feel really, really blessed to have been here and had you, had you be able to, to help save my life and uh, to help you know, support my family in the way that you have and uh, develop me as a provider and as a nurse. It's, it's been big. And I've seen you develop other physicians too. I mean, the, when we got my um, chest, abdomen, pelvis CT, and just recently 
and uh, there was a suspicious finding about a lymph node, and you and Deb came into my room and sat down, and I could tell that was a really hard conversation for you to have, and for, for Deb to have. And uh, you know, you sat down right next to me on the bed, and um, kind of put your hand on my knee and said, okay, this is what we found, but um, here's what we're gonna do. This is our plan. And you made me feel like it was okay. And you left the room and then I fell apart, but I still knew it was gonna be okay. It's being a patient, an interesting thing. I just had my knee replaced. It was pretty bad. I was back in the gym in the office in four days. I was in the OR in seven days. I was satisfied, I was a huge success, but all really wasn't that good. I bled, I had a crit of 25, I couldn't stay awake, I still have to take an afternoon nap most days, I couldn't sleep, I had night sweats, and every pain medicine made me sick and delirious. I was satisfied, I just didn't feel very good. And I, and I found a whole bunch of things that actually did help make me feel good. Acupuncture was great. After the second day, I took acupuncture and non-steroidals. That's all I took for pain. I still get these um, image-guided therapy. It's fabulous. Like the pain goes away. I'm okay with that. I like the pain going away. It's wonderful. The difference between curing and healing was nicely pointed out in this, this uh, month's edition of Pharos. And curing, treating or eliminating disease, as opposed to healing, regaining purpose in life, was nicely pointed out. Lee Smith was an author. She couldn't get over her son's death. She went to see a psychiatrist. He said, okay, I'll give you a prescription. She thought it would be a sedative. The prescription said, write fiction every day. She was an author. She said, I can't do that. I'm too broken up. He said, show up, sit in the chair, get to work. She did that for three days. I've not read on Agate Hill, but I'm told it's a masterful novel that she wrote starting on day four. What made the psychiatrist see into her and know that that's what she, uh, uh, I don't know. But the agenda being set by the patient, I think, is central to this. There's a wonderful book by Alan Hamilton. He talks about when he was a medical student in, at Man's Greatest Hospital, and you know the Harvard professor with the long coat goes in to see Giovanni. Giovanni's a poor laborer and, and in the north end of Boston. And he says, Giovanni, you need your heart valve replaced. And Giovanni, we've got you scheduled for tomorrow. He was a cardiologist. I guess he figured he could just order the cardiac surgery like uh, CBC, right? And he said, uh, so well, I can't do that until I talk to my doctor. And so, you know, listen, everybody talks back to me, but nobody talks back to the Harvard professor, right? So he apparently, there was this stunned silence, and Professor Sochter goes, well, what's your doctor's phone number? He says, I have no idea. He says, well, where do you work? I, I have no idea. And now he's getting steamed. And he goes, well, how am I going to talk to your doctor if you don't know his phone number or where he works? He said, see, he's right there. Pointed to the third-year medical student. The person that came and sat and talked to him every day. And I just took care of this lady, 82-year-old Muslim lady, came in with a terrible soft tissue infection. We made the decision to make her DNR and keep her comfortable. And her family then became the world's most aggressive group of people. So what sent her to hospice, they said, she can't go to Gilchrist because it has Christ in the name. I mean, we, we went around and around and around, and I, I didn't get it. And I went home to see my mom for Easter. I came back, I said, I can't. I can't go talk to him. And as I started walking out, I felt my mother get ready to hit me in the head, and I said, okay, I'll go talk to him. And I walked in, and the most aggressive daughter came up to me and completely broke down, started sobbing, grabbed my arm and said, please don't make me take my mother home. I can't stand to see her die in my house. I got it. 
But had I not walked back in, we never would have had that conversation. That's it. This is Mary Magdalene from the Louvre. Now, I didn't know much at Easter, right? I didn't know an awful lot about her. She's from Magdala, and Jesus cast out the seven demons is the story. And the popular myth is that she was a whore and that Jesus saved her from being stoned, but there's actually no proof that's true. And she was at the crucifixion. She found the empty tomb, and Jesus is, was supposed to have appeared to her after rising from the dead. I took my mom to Easter church a couple of years ago, and the sermon that day was about Mary Magdalene. And, and this is what the priest said. So you want to see my a 93-year-old at that point, now 95-year-old, Lady get all Italian lady get all wound up, then the priest talked about intimacy. But uh, I, uh, I thought about that and I said, boy, that's sort of like the relationship we should have with our patients. We should be passionate and we are physical with them and we should care for them and, and we should be that close to them. Now, the chances I'm going to call the dean and tell him that I'm intimate with my patients is a small number. But I think it's a good construct. And we can go back to, to Jerry's presidential address to get a certain amount of insight on that, that it can't just be about the surgery. And he quoted Hippocrates. Hippocrates actually came from the family of Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. And the story is that Asclepius was visiting a sick friend and a serpent twined around his staff he killed it it was replaced by another snake with healing herbs and circular temples were built on hills near wells guarded by serpents no one was allowed to die and sick people went there to have healing dreams kind of like what being admitted to the hospital ought to be about Asclepius now I really like this this is the lapis lazula Buddha and every time you see the Buddha, underneath it is written, I will heal with my radiance and presence, which I think is a completely cool concept. I'll heal with my radiance and presence. This is my Buddha. It sits in my office. It was given to me by then Lieutenant Colonel Al Philp, who was before you, Joe, but you know him, who was one of our Sea Stars people. And uh, Al took it to war three times, brought it home, and as he left, that was my going away presence. Really, it's a very peaceful part of an otherwise chaotic world. And it occurs to me that I've been incredibly lucky. I went to China after the earthquake, took the only non-Chinese team. This was our ICU, which was a big room with a lot of beds in it. I learned a huge amount about healing and curing from the Chinese people. Traction Haitian style learned another huge amount about taking care of people in Haiti. We just saw them on the ground. We didn't have anything to work with. And yes, they really did need help. I went to Afghanistan where I saw more humanity. I saw more inhumanity and more humanity than any uh, place else. This little kid you see with Dr. DeBose, uh, walked out of his house and had a sulfur bomb explode and lost his anterior abdominal wall. I took care of him when I was in Bagram, right? In Bagram. Joe called me when he was the trauma czar there. He said, remember that little kid? Kid been in the hospital a year. And I said, yeah, yeah, I remember him. He said, I'm going to close this abdominal wall. Is that crazy? I said, yeah, it's terribly crazy, Joe. But yeah, it's a great idea. Let, let's said, uh, can I talk to you about it? So we, we chatted for about 30 minutes about it. And he said, you are going to be in town that day, right? You're going to be available if I need to call. Yeah, yeah, that's OK. And Joe closed them, and he grafted them. And this is the kid going home a year afterwards and told all the people at the st in the hospital he was sorry he had to leave. By now, he spoke English. He made rounds every day with the team, <laughs> carried his IV pole. And nobody, he said, but, you know, my family needs me, so I need to go home. And nobody ever once, a year, 13 months, ever said, why are we doing this for an Afghani? It was one of the most human things, I think, I've ever seen. I was delighted to help a little bit. Now, I took care of this one young lady about 10 years ago. She came in. She had 
terrible brain injury. She developed multiple compartment syndrome. We now stand these people straight up. Here she is standing straight up on the tilt table. I decompress her abdomen. We do everything, and she's dying. And there we are cannulating her for ECMO, standing straight up on the tilt table. She lived. She turned down Yale to go to Vanderbilt, and she became a nurse practitioner. She comes and sees me every year. And uh, she came around Christmas, as she always does. We took the uh, obligatory picture, and I talked to her about this issue of patient satisfaction. And later that day, she sent me the picture with the email heading, if you ever want to know, this is what patient satisfaction looks like. With her fiance, you allowed this to happen. And I, I just thought that said it all. Now, you know, many, many uh, issues. I refer you to the September Journal of Trauma when Sarah Murthy and I wrote a piece on critical, what we call t called terminal critical illness, the people that live in the ICU but that can never get out. They're tough conversations to have, but they're incredibly important conversations. And this is also data from Dr. Jerkovich I think about all the time. What do people that, where you give them bad news, what's important to them? It's clarity, it's privacy, it's sympathy. That's what's important to the people. Now, Maryland is a very small place, and we recently had two officers shot and executed at a Panera. It's a big deal. I went and spoke to the family. The son lost his mind and started you know, punching the wall and breaking up the room, and his mom tried to get him to stop. And I, I said, just let him go. So he broke the room up for about 45 minutes. I just sat there. And we got ready to take his dad down to take him to the medical examiner. And he came over and he grabbed me and said, you come with us. I want you to be there with my family. Here we are walking through the hallways. As we walked out, all of the cops lined the hall and they reached out and touched me. It was a very eerie experience, I guess, in case they're next, we're connected. And we are connected. They lined the street, saluted as the ambulance drove by. You know, the cops in Maryland are, they're part of our family. And I walked back to the office and I was completely, I was distraught at the world's highest level. Stevie, came and said, read this. I said, Stevie, I can't do it right now. She grabbed me. She put this letter in my hand and said, read this. It was from Matt Davis's father. Matt was our fellow. I sponsored him for membership in many things. Matt died at age 40, 41. Last year when he fell off a mountain, he was climbing. And in the letter from his dad, was his recollections of Baltimore. He said that I walked in and said, this will be the most difficult year of your life, physically, mentally, and emotionally. You'll never be tested more. This will be the best year of your life. You'll learn more, do more, and experience more than any other time in your life. All I ask from you is excellence each and every time you set foot in the building. It's not that I dislike mediocrity. I won't tolerate it, which is an exact quote of what I say to the fellows every year. And he kind of reached back, kind of like Felix does, and touched me. And why did that letter come that day? I don't know. But it really put things in some degree of perspective. And as I age and confront my own mortality, it's the legacy that we leave that's going to be important. You know, how, how am I going to leave the place better than I did? Well, one way will be the gifts that I leave behind. The best thing I ever did in my life was endow a professorship for my mom. There will, as long as there's a University of Maryland, there's going to be an Ann Scalia professor of surgery. It's Sharon Henry right now, but then it'll be somebody else, and after that, it'll be somebody else. 
My family has been my moral compass. Every time I have a decision, I think, what would my, well, I don't have to because I I immediately duck because my mother's going to hit me in the back of the head again. And it occurs to me that you guys, you don't have my mom, but you got a whole bunch of people that I know and I'm sure a bunch of people that I don't know that are your examples and you should emulate them you should want to be like them they are it's a remarkable group of people to have in a single division so how will we be remembered i don't know it'll be by those we heal that's easy it'll be by those we train for sure it'll be by those we inspire if any and inspiring us inspiring those who will follow is the most one of the most important things we do we're privileged to do what we do, why would you be in a bad mood? It's a great job, and you get paid. I mean, what could be bad? And It's the people in the bed that are staring at the ceiling. They're the ones that are having a bad day. And as healthcare executives know nothing about health or, or caring, it's up to us to drive this bus. It can't be about the money, the computer, or what's in it for us. My mama told me a thousand, ten thousand times when I was a kid, you do for others before you do for yourself. You listen to Felix, just do the right thing. We could start this by just taking good care of people. Do for the patients first. It's not that hard. It would solve 75% of the problems. And, you know, I don't know what for me. I, I, uh, you know, I'm getting ready to turn 65. You guys missed your cue. This is where you say, oh, no, you can't be that old. (laughs) Come on. But it's true. And so this is not my problem. It's not Jerry's problem. It's, you know, it's not those of us that have been around for a while. It's your guy's problem. You guys need to tackle this. You guys need to learn. You guys need to craft the future. For me, I don't know, I will uh, keep taking a swing at it. I'll try to inspire those who will follow me. And I made a promise to Jerry that I will try to repaint the ceiling every day. And maybe one day, maybe one day I uh, will heal with my radiance and presence and not just my hands. I thank you guys so much for the invitation and the attention. Really a special honor. And I I don't completely want to embarrass you, but I do want to uh, take the opportunity to thank Felix's wife for being here with us. Could I get you to come take a picture? I think I just want to say, Tom, I can't imagine a more um, outstanding presentation to honor. It's been a while. (laughs) Well, I'm glad I brushed my teeth this morning. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Suck it in. We'll just skip all that part. Perfect. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I guess we have a few seconds for questions. It's hard to follow that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I got over that so after a while. It took a while. And I was a little mean and I was a little funny. Mm-hmm. And it's taken a few years for somebody to show me that I can be comfortable in my skin and mm-hmm. sense that will come into my body. How do we get to that to our residents? Yeah, it's a really hard thing. Um, I, I don't know. It's not like I have the answer here. 
Um, it's, you know, like most things, I think, it, it, there's a certain balance here. I still, I don't think that being harsh is wrong. Some of the time, right? I, you know, somebody screws up and hurts, makes a dumb decision or an unfeeling decision and hurts a patient and they, yeah, that's not a very nice conversation that I have with them. And I, I don't lose, I mean, everybody knows when I get silent, that's really bad. That's when it's really bad because I never blow up, but I'm very direct with those people. And I'm going to guess that most of them remember that for more than a few minutes. Having said that, I, I, I think that um, most of us aren't, or, or many people, become uncomfortable um, saying, I don't know. I say it all the time. I don't care. You know who's the most, the person that is the most likely to call for help in the operating room in our group is me. I love having friends there. This isn't about, hey, come to work, come on down. Show me a trick, help me do something. And um, I, I think we're better when we do things like that. And so I think the ability to acknowledge that you don't know everything, the ability to acknowledge you screwed up. Yeah, you know, I really wish I had to, I wish I really wish I had that to do over again. Because I think I'd go over here instead of going over there is I think integral and I think um, very, very important. I go in to tell and, and talk to patients and their families and said, you know what? Wasn't our best day. Sorry. Uh, you, you know, I haven't been sued for it yet. Maybe I will be. I don't, you know, I, I think that's part of being honest with yourself. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I frankly, I don't care. I mean, I'm not going to, I, I will not let those people fill in the whoever you, I'm not going to let them put me in a box. You know, I, I'm not going to let them. And if I, they don't want me to work there anymore, they can go find somebody else to, to have my job. I don't see a long line out of my door waiting. And, well, I guess Deb is, but <laughs> not yet. And so I, I think that that's part of what we have to do. Part of what we have to do is insist and not be willing to allow them to say, you know, you have to stand at, on, at attention on your left foot and salute. I'm not, not going to do that. It's not, not going to do that. So, uh, you know, I don't know. You, you figure, everybody figures it out for themselves. But I, I, I do think that figuring it out is incredibly important thing to do, however you're going to do it for you. Yes, sir. That's correct. So I wonder how you sort of <coughs> address that issue. Because I, I got the sense from what you talked about that you developed this way to identify what the patient's expectations are and be able to manage Yeah, them. the first thing I tell every patient is that they get one promise from me, that I will do the best job I can to take care of them. That's the only promise you're going to get. You get no guarantee as to the result, only that I'll, because, you know, those of us that do, you know, this complicated stuff, lots of times it doesn't work out quite the way you wanted it to. And, and so I think if you start with that, I at least have found that pretty helpful. And, and um, you know, I try not to take it personally. Uh, yeah, I all, all, all the time say, listen, if you'd like to, you want to go get a second opinion, it's okay. Please. If somebody else thinks they're smarter than me, it's okay. Oh, I'll only do 649 cases this year instead of 650. It's okay. And um, I think that the other thing I think you, you, that we don't do a very good job of is, is managing 
um, the team and the way they define expectations for the family. And I do that a little bit differently because I make rounds at night instead of during in the morning. And so I walk around at night because that's when the patient's families are there. And so that means I go home late. Oh, okay. Um, but I really think it's very, very helpful to walk in at about 7 at night. And um, you can sit and you can answer their questions. And instead of them talking to the intern who talks to the – and I bring the team with me so everybody is very clear as to what the, um, you know, what the messaging is here. And I – Try to do, you know, try to take care of them the way I would want my mama cared for. Oh. Thanks.